How's it going, everyone? I'm Nick, and you're listening to the Fresh Perspective Podcast. This episode is the third part of a series I like to call 50 Habits for Maximizing Personal Health and Well-Being. In this series, we get to the bottom of what the experts actually recommend for the average person to be well, free from the noise of trendy health gurus, alternative medicine peddlers, and your eccentric uncle. Today, we are shifting focus from the body to the mind. Stay tuned as we consider five habits for a healthy mind, simple choices you can make to improve your cognition, brain function, memory, and overall mental health. This program is brought to you by the contributing members of the Free Thought Initiative. We help those in need of an inclusive, supportive, and free-thinking community by hosting public discussions on moral philosophy, healthy living, and science to improve the cohesion, health, and scientific literacy of our society. Everyone is welcome, regardless of personal background, religious belief, political leanings, etc., to participate in person in these open and civil discussions each week. To find a free thought forum meeting near you, to start your own local group, or to support this program through monthly donations, please visit freethoughtforum.org. While you're there, be sure to check out our online store, now with free thought t-shirts, mugs, and other smart-looking swag. In conversations about health, or any aspect of reality for that matter, it is important to remain as grounded and objective as possible. I will do my best to keep that in mind, so that you can walk away with useful facts and not just a pile of opinions. My goals have been to start with a clean slate on any given subject, look into reputable sources, see what they say, and then build these lists from there. For every podcast released by the Free Thought Forum, a companion blog post is also created, featuring a complete transcript of each episode. If you would like to take a look at my sources for the claims made here, you need only take a look at this episode's corresponding blog post on our website. Your mind is the most valuable tool, and one that should be kept sharp. Most of the time, we don't like to consider how common it is for our brains to deteriorate as we age or as we submit them to abuse. When it comes to the gray matter between our ears, I figure that it is always better to be safe than sorry. And that starts with a good idea of what it takes to maintain one's mental health. For our purposes, the general topic of mental health is divided into cognitive health, dealing with learning, memory, and general brain function, and emotional health, dealing with mood, stress, and so forth. I think this helps our conversation focus more on the brain and less on emotional disorders that deserve their own episodes. Now that we are in the right headspace, the time has come to explore five things you can do to allow your brain to function at its best. One. Maintain your physical health through sufficient exercise, sleep, and nutrition. All right, I have a confession to make. After talking about physical health and hygiene so much in the past episodes, I said that we would move on to the mind. But some 80% of the relevant literature I found on the behaviors that promote good brain function and cognitive health circle back to those things we've been talking about all along, like exercise, proper diet, and getting plenty of sleep. The thing is, the separation between the mind and the body is a completely arbitrary one. There really isn't a place where your physical body ends and your brain begins. It is all connected, and that connection is something that seems to grow ever more significant as our research into neurology, psychology, and other related sciences continue to expand. In short, if you want to keep your brain well, you must also maintain your physical health. Your mental health at any age is strongly influenced by your physical well-being. Avoiding a sedentary lifestyle, exercising at least 30 minutes a day, drinking a glass of water with every meal, ensuring that half of each meal is comprised of diversified vegetables, getting about 8 hours of sleep each night, and other such habits explored in greater detail in Part 1 of this series, have all been shown to protect against dementia and improve brain functions such as executive control function, processing speed, synaptic plasticity, learning, memory, and other attentional processes. 2. Learn new skills and solve challenging puzzles. Your brain is a lot like your muscles in that it tends to only be strong enough to solve the problems with which it is presented. If you don't happen to find yourself solving intense cognitive problems on a near daily basis, then you would do well to take some time on most days to learn a new skill, such as a language, dance, sport, or new creative hobby. 
It also helps to play challenging word games like crossword puzzles, math games like Sudoku, and even difficult video games. Of course, not all games are created equal. The one you played for 5 hours last Friday probably didn't weigh too heavily on your cognitive load. If a game is getting easy, you need to move on to a greater challenge. The novelty of the task at hand is a big part of its positive impact on your mind. So switch the difficulty setting to hard or give a new game a try with completely different core mechanics. 3. Daily Book Reading if you know about my background teaching elementary students, you probably saw this coming from a mile away. This healthy habit is related to the last one, but the studies on how it affects your cognition really caught my attention, and I feel that giving it its own place on this list is justified. Leisurely daily book reading has been shown to improve one's academic performance, brain interconnectivity, vocabulary, overall intelligence, and more. Among the elderly, daily reading has even been shown to increase one's lifespan. But there's a catch. Not all kinds of reading lead to the same benefits. When we read from computers, smartphones, tablets, or other screens, we typically engage less of our brains, show less focus, and remember less of what we read. Therefore, reading is best done with physical books. In case you were wondering, fewer benefits have been found with magazines or newspapers. You may be thinking, but what about listening to podcasts? I suspect that listening to a podcast is better for your brain than something less mentally engaging like pop music. But maintaining a coherent narrative in your mind, doing the mental work to translate words from a page, and the focus required to make sense out of abstraction, etc., all lead to a much better mental workout than simply listening to something like your favorite radio personality. But to be fair, I can be totally wrong about that. We know, at least, that book reading really goes a long way, so until I find out otherwise, I am perfectly comfortable asserting that we would all do well to stick with the printed page for at least a few minutes every day. As a side note, if you are in need of something mentally stimulating to read that also happens to encourage free thought, feel free to visit the recommended reading list on our website. I've recently added a couple of volumes to it, and I'm pretty proud of the collection we have so far. 4. Abstain from or reduce drug and alcohol usage. When teens or young adults are first convinced to try things like weed, vaping, smoking, or alcohol, they tend not to be aware of the real effects these things have on the brain. Now, do they cause holes to form in your brain like what I was told when I was a teenager? No. But the effect they have isn't zero, either. When talking about mental health, we need to be honest with ourselves and with the facts. If we end up sounding like your grandparents, or like stoners, that shouldn't matter. The truth is what matters most. So, here's the truth. These substances are powerful, and that power should be respected. So that we don't get lost in the weeds of this massive topic, I will give some statistics and move on. If you would like me to wrestle in greater depth with the mental effects of specific or general drug and alcohol use in the future, let me know. Compared to those who don't use drugs or alcohol, long-term daily marijuana users have poorer learning, memory, and slower reaction times on some tasks later in life. Long-term tobacco users also have been shown to have overall worse mental health and a 20% increased risk for cognitive impairment later in life. Those who drink alcohol at least weekly have a 17% increased risk for cognitive impairment in late adulthood, a risk that rises sharply with additional alcohol consumption. 5. Take a day off. We would also do well to occasionally give our minds time to rest. Overworking and mental fatigue is directly linked to various mental and emotional disorders. Therefore, it is important to dedicate something like an entire day each week to less mentally taxing tasks. With that said, I'm not sure that staring at the TV, computer, or phone is considered a good break for your brain. I'm also not talking about sleep in this case. But there are people who tax their minds past their limits, and I've seen the kind of devastating crashes that come as a result. If you don't take enough breaks, your body tends to force you to take breaks, and that is a hard thing to watch. Your mental faculties need some time, every so often, to recover. So, what things can you do to give your brain some much-deserved time off? 
I imagine that simple tasks like doing the dishes, gardening, or going for a walk all fall in this category. Perhaps even giving yourself some silence can help. I'll wrap up this episode on that note. I suppose that I speak for many of us when I say that we may be addicted to distraction. Ask yourself, when was the last time you listened to silence, or the white noise of the wind or city around you? Intentional periodic disconnection from the endless deluge of information made possible by the internet could yield impressive results. Maybe getting some peace and quiet is worth thinking about when we are thinking about cognitive health. If you have enjoyed this conversation or have learned something from it, please leave a like, subscribe, and share it with other open-minded people. All of those things really do make a big difference and help others find our group and our podcast. Thank you. That is all I have for you today, but the conversation continues across social media and in the comment sections below. Do you agree with today's message? Am I mistaken about some detail? What feedback or ideas do you have for this program or our organization? Feel free to share your perspective. A special shout out goes to Shane Whistler, Lance Freeman, and Brooke. Your monthly support makes this all possible. To check out our awesome donor rewards starting at $1 per month, please visit freethoughtforum.org slash donate.